Hello and welcome to another preview show here at a very sunny Vitality Stadium. We've had a two week break but myself and matchday commentator Chris Temple will be going through all things AFC Bournemouth in the next half an hour or so. Let's take a look at what's coming up. We'll be looking back at that 2-2 draw against Newcastle here at Vitality Stadium. We'll be discussing all of our internationals and where they've been playing over the last week. And finally, we'll be looking ahead to tomorrow's game against Leicester at the King Power Stadium. But first, let's start back at that 2-2 draw against Newcastle here at Vitality Stadium. Let's remind ourselves of the short highlights. Almost in line with the post, it's Rondon right-footed! What a brilliant free kick from Solomon Rondon! And Newcastle have the lead here at the Vitality Stadium, deep into stoppage time at the end of the first half. It was a silly free kick to give away Bournemouth with a corner at one end, Newcastle on the break at the other, Almiron brought down and Solomon Rondon curls one over the top of the Cherries. Delivers across towards the six-yard area, Ake is waiting, he's gone down under the challenge there from Fernandez, and Mike Dean points to the spot, Bournemouth have a penalty, high fives for Nathan Ake from Jefferson Lerma and Callum Wilson. From the penalty spot, King sends the Bravka the wrong way, gets the Vitality Stadium up on their feet, they conceded late in the first half, they have levelled things up early in the second, it's Joshua King from the spot, it's Bournemouth 1, Newcastle 1. Now Joshua King could stride forward in the rain into the Newcastle half, lays it off towards Wilson, he's just bitten to the ball by Fernandez, but then it's given away, Solanke is there, thinks about pulling the trigger the first time, hesitates, lays it back towards Joshua King! Cherry's in front from a goal down here at the Vitality Stadium, and that was brilliant, patient play from Don Solanke, thought about the shot, decided against it, laid it off to the on-rushing King, he has a brace, it's Bournemouth 2, Newcastle 1. to Yedlin, Yedlin with a cross in towards the back post, drops to Matt Ritchie, who volleys the ball into the top corner, the roof of the net, Boric got a touch on it but it wasn't enough, and Bournemouth can't hold on for the three points, Newcastle score in stoppage time at the end of the first half, and they score in stoppage time at the end of the second to level this game up, and Eddie Howe rolls his eyes and looks to the clouds. The away supporters are going nuts. It's Bournemouth 2, Newcastle 2. Well, a last-minute equaliser from Matt Ritchie there. Chris, it was a game that was pretty similar to last year, a 2-2 scoreline, but unfortunately Newcastle scoring at the death this time. Yeah, I think Bournemouth would be pretty sick of seeing Newcastle this season because obviously uh, the performance up there in the season wasn't very good and uh, and three crucial points went begging then and obviously here two went begging in the, the last few seconds. You know, absolute corking goal by Matt Ritchie. We've seen him do it in a Bournemouth shirt and unfortunately this time it was in a Newcastle shirt. But yeah, frustrating having come from behind uh, to get yourself in front at home as well against a team below you in the table, having just found a bit of momentum from the Huddersfield game as well when things look like they clicked back into gear. Um, so that was a real good opportunity to just to, to keep that ball rolling really and heading into this last chunk of the season. So yeah, really frustrating to, to see it slip away. Eddie was you know, pretty honest afterwards. It wasn't the team's best performance of the season. But again, we, it's a cliche. We've said it a number of times. If you're not playing brilliantly, but still putting yourself pretty much with a chance of victory, then uh, it's not all bad. But as it turned out, it was yeah, two points slipping away right at the end. And it looked like it could be another comeback, obviously being 1-0 down and then going 2-1 up. We've seen it so many times before. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, going 1-0 down at home, uh, we've seen teams fold in the past and we've seen Bournemouth fold in the past, not not in the recent history. You know, the comeback kings as they were tagged for a while. Uh, unfortunately, it was Newcastle sort of doing the comebacking, if you like. But, yeah, ultimately, you know, there was a lot of players who were coming back into form all of a sudden. You know, we've, we'll talk about internationals in a minute, but, um, you know, the, the, the front players are all scoring and contributing, um, which is boding well for the rest of the season now. So, yeah. Yeah, um, well, I guess the positive was they did come back from behind and, and uh, put themselves in with a chance of getting three, but ultimately, yeah, Mr Ritchie. Mm. 
and Joshua King, another two goals for him. Of course, he scored two on international duty as well. He's in, he's in great form, isn't he? Yeah, he's flying at the moment. And that, you know, really, really important as well with Callum Wilson having been out of the team for a while and only just coming back and obviously finding his way um, back, you know, with those three goals in successive games, um, scoring at Huddersfield as well. Um, Joshua King, as you say, is becoming Norway's key player, really. Um, he's, you know, scoring both of their internationals. So I think when you've got Ryan Fraser and obviously David Brooks, you know, both of the wing the wing guys are contributing goals and assists as well. Um, so to have Wilson and King both scoring, um, I'm hoping that's that's sort of a real positive leading into this last section of the season. And of course, as you said, it could have been three points, but another point on the board against Newcastle team that let's not forget we're in very good form going into the game. Yeah, I mean, that shouldn't be forgotten. Newcastle have, have sort of turned it around. They've had a difficult season and um, they seem to have had a couple of difficult seasons sort of back to back, really. I guess the frustration is that Bournemouth could be sitting there now on 40 points and probably should be sat on 40 points, um, which is sort of that notional mark that everybody absolutely turns off the uh, the relegation worries and whatever. Um, and also, you know, it puts you a lot closer to that seventh place than it does now. I mean, seventh is looking, it's looking a tall order now, to be honest with you. Uh, I know it's, you know, mathematically it's possible. I think Eddie said this morning to me that they would have to go on a really good run and hope that other teams above them start to stumble um, to finish seventh. But there are, you know, there are many other things still on the, the, the radar, including one we've been talking about for three or four weeks now, which is the, uh, the best of a points tally. Nine points needed from 21 to get there. So, yeah, regrettable that the team aren't a couple of points further up the uh, up the, the ladder, if you like. It's a very American term, ladder, sorry. Um, but uh, yeah, it's all in all, a point's better than them. And as you say, it's worth mentioning, obviously, there was a two-week break going into, you know, after the Newcastle game. And it's important not to lose going into that and confidence can still be there. Yeah, I think, if anything, the two-week break's probably helped in terms of, like, shaking off that Newcastle result as well because um, everyone's been here, there and everywhere. Um, obviously, the team, you know, been away to Dubai before that as well so it's been a sort of a bitty few, two or three weeks really um, so I guess it, it's not as if they've been sat over the international break for two weeks stewing on the Newcastle result of course a few players are going to have been around and have been, going to have been uh, sort of disappointed by it but I think we've learned this group seemed to move on pretty quickly so yeah if anything the international break with everybody dis disappearing off to all corners um, you know probably helped to get over that I think. Well after that Newcastle game the squad headed off to Dubai let's take a little look at what they got up to. Well, that was the team heading out to Dubai to do some warm weather training. Chris, we've seen them do it before and traditionally it's seen them 
have a really strong end to the season coming back from this Dubai break, haven't they? Let's hope it works again then in that in that case. Yeah, I mean, it's good for the players who haven't gone away on international duty. Um, you know, quite a small select group these days because there are, are so many who do go away. Um, so it's important, I guess, you know, at this stage of the season when you've been training since, what, July when they came out for pre-season, I think a change of scenery um, is useful. Um, you know, whether it's worth the money or not, we'll find out, as you say, over the next couple of months or so. And I know fans have mixed views about it, but I think, you know, if, if you saw the players coming in every single day to the same training ground, you do need to freshen up, particularly the, you know, the international players always have a little trip away and a little fresh challenge to to I guess to aim for um, so for the players who aren't involved in international I think it's I think it's important um, and also they get some hard work done as well you know it's different conditions um, you know just a little bit of a I guess a, a fitness burst and they'll, they'll be managing it as well because it has been a long season so although they can sort of sharpen up for this last run they don't want to be slogging them into the ground because players are you know they will be starting to feel the season by this point of the year uh, of the campaign as well so yeah no from the pictures we just saw it looks like it was a, a profitable trip unfortunately you and I didn't get invited <laughs> maybe next year <laughs> maybe <laughs> and of course we saw Lou Lewis Cook and Simon Francis, players that have had long-term injuries out there working hard for them. That must have been really nice to have that change of scenery. Yeah, definitely. I think that really important for them. That's, I think that's a good point. You know, they've been, although I think they've been sort of out and doing different things in different places already. But yeah, just to be back around the squad and, and feeling part of it again. Um, I know they're here every day, but, you know, they're often training on their own in the gym and things. So, yeah, it looks, it looked really good to see them back and, and sort of stepping things up. Lewis Cook, who uh, I know has sort of tweeted this week or posted on Instagram how good it was to be taking big steps forward now. Um, and of course, it's going to be a long summer for those guys because they're continuing to rehabilitate, whereas other players will um, be literally on the beach, I'm sure. Um, so mentally, it'll be important they do get a break as well, but the work won't stop for those guys. Um, and even the likes of Junior Stanislas, Adam Smith, let's not forget, you know, I think Adam Smith is probably a little bit ahead of, ahead of schedule now, coming back from his uh, his problems. So hopefully we'll see him in the next couple of weeks. Um, and Junior Stanislas, you know, we know his problems in the past, so it'd be good to see um, him back in the next couple of weeks, hopefully as well. And for those who didn't go to Dubai, they're obviously off on international national duty and it's been quite a good international break for, for our players obviously we've talked about Joshua King scoring two goals and Callum Wilson became the first Cherries player to get a competitive appearance for England as well yeah becoming the most capped Cherries player with two um, for England and a senior international it was really good to, for him to get off the bench as well because obviously the way the games went um, you know you thought he might get off the bench in the first game but uh, you know it was good in the second one to uh, to get some minutes I mean when you look at the list of internationals actually there was a couple of couple of key ones to point out I mean David Brooks we've got a nod towards him winning the the Wales senior and, and young player of the year at the same time um, we think if, in case people are wondering if he's not been noticed he's been noticed um, Ryan Fraser was you know it's coming for a bit of stick actually um, and the manager in his press conference uh, today was was you know um, and actually in his interview with me was very quick to defend Ryan Fraser and say it wasn't Ryan Fraser's decision not to play against Kazakhstan and um, for those who weren't aware of that um, he, he chose not to play at Kazakhstan because they have a plastic pitch basically and because of his injury record he, he sort of didn't make himself available for that game now Scotland of course lost the game which was probably the worst possible situation for Fraser all round. Uh, but Eddie Howe was keen to point out it was a collective decision that he didn't play, worried about his injury record. He also pointed out that if it was a training session with Bournemouth on a plastic pitch, Ryan Fraser wouldn't take part, which I think tells us all we need to know. Um, so obviously he played a part in the San Marino win. Um, a couple of others to mention, Dom Solanke obviously here, um, scoring captain in the under-21s, which is great. And he's had a bit of a stop-start season to his uh, start to his Bournemouth career. So I think that was important for him. Um, Mark Travers, I should mention as well, he was on the bench for the Irish senior squad for the first time. As we've said before, highly rated here. Interesting summer coming up goalkeeping wise, I think here. Um, so that would be that would have been great for him to uh, to be in and around that that squad. Uh, they won as well. He was shared a bench with Harry Arter um, uh, and Jefferson Lerma. I think we should mention as well because he's actually played for Colombia for the first time since the World Cup last summer. It's not been totally clear why he hasn't been involved. I mean, there's been no sort of um, no uh, guess call from Eddie Howe to leave him out because of the travelling or anything or getting used to being in England or anything like that. So um, he just didn't seem to be selected for whatever reason. So he played in Japan in their um, their friendly against Japan, um, which was good for him as well. I think he deserved that that call up as well. So yeah, a huge list. Nathan Ake was probably the only disappointment he didn't get off the bench for Holland, but he's he's behind Van Dijk and De Ligt at the moment, which is a, a real tough central defensive combination to get past. And just going back to Ryan Fraser there, obviously when he did play against San Marino, we saw him get yet another assist. So that'll be perfect for his confidence coming back into the Premier League season. Yeah, absolutely. He's, you know, he's, he's another one who he admitted himself after the Huddersfield game, he had a bit of a lull earlier in the season, but those the flair players will have lulls. You can't be at the top level every single week. Um, he's had a brilliant season, absolutely fantastic. Um, and the one thing he wanted to point out to us after the game at Huddersfield was that his goals get overlooked a little bit. Um, you know, everyone talks about his assists and you just mentioned it there for Scotland as well, but he's been contributing goals for Scotland and for Bournemouth as well. So I think that's been a, a key part of his game. He did at Huddersfield, of course, as well. 
well. Um, so yeah, I think he'll be keen to add a, a couple more goals to his, his tally, edging up possibly towards double figures. Maybe if I'm being a bit ambitious, I don't know. But um, yeah, I, I think I think he was he was harshly treated by the, the Scottish fans. To be honest, you probably only know half the story. And maybe when they read Eddie Howe's comments after today's press conference, they'll probably hopefully be uh, slightly placated. And just touching on Dominic Slanky again, how much of a psychological boost can it be now that he's scored here at Vitality Stadium and it can hopefully kick him on for the rest of the season? Yeah, it's another another sort of milestone ticked off, isn't it? Next thing to do is to score here in a Bournemouth shirt, but. I think, you know, there's that little bit extra expectation on you when you are the local player, if you like. You're doing all the pre-match interviews in, in the England camp. Um, I guess he's on the front of the programme. He's probably on the posters as well, trying to sell tickets. Um, so there is that little bit of expectation, and particularly as somebody who's quite new here as well. Um, he's not as if he's a, a local favourite yet. So I think scoring was, was important. It was nice to see him leading the team out. He played well as well. He had a difficult first half. Germany were obviously better in the first half, but I think, you know, he, I think he won man of the match as well. So um, all in all, you know, it was a, it was a good night's work for him. Um, his, his problem now is that King and Wilson are playing so well that uh, opportunities in the team for him are going to be few and far between, I think, between now and the end of the season. Absolutely. Well, next up for the Cherries, the attention turns to Leicester City in the Premier League. It was quite the afternoon here earlier in the season, so let's remind ourselves of what happened.
Well, what an afternoon that was here at Vitality Stadium. Chris, they'll be hoping very much for a similar outcome tomorrow, won't they? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, it was a scintillating performance for most of the game. Obviously, I know Eddie was, you know what Eddie's like with his standards. He was disappointed to concede two at the end because it, uh, it gave Leicester a slightly flattering gloss. But, I mean, I did a piece on BBC Radio Leicester this week and they talk about that game as probably their worst performance of the season. Um, you know, Bournemouth obviously played very well. So, yeah, some more of that would be lovely. Um, Leicester have just turned a corner, though, haven't they, unfortunately? At, probably at the wrong time. Brendan Rodgers coming in, three wins out of four since replacing Claude Puel. Um, three points ahead of Bournemouth in the table at the moment. So right in that little shake-up for, you know, top half finishes and, and possibly finishing seventh or eighth. So from that point of view, it's, it's quite an important game. If Leicester win this weekend, then I would think Bournemouth will struggle to catch them this season. Um, but, you know, anything, anything, a draw or a win, keeps them sort of right within within distance. Um, the thing I like about Leicester all of a sudden is that they've, they've gone in the past down the foreign route. A lot of foreign players have come in. But actually, you look at the, the sort of backbone of their team these days. I don't know Harry Maguire suspended this weekend, but you think of Maguire and Chilwell, who are both in the England team. Vardy, of course, would be in the England team probably, but retired. Um, you think of the likes of Damari Gray, who is linked here, James Madison. Um, I'm, you know, a number of Leicester players who have all of a sudden have, uh, have come through in a, the backbone of their team. So I guess you can draw comparisons with what Eddie's doing here with sort of young British players. Uh, and that's encouraging to see. And I think that will connect... Um, Leicester fans sort of back with their team again. They felt a bit disillusioned, I think, under under Claude Puel, which that lot down the road across the New Forest at Southampton will um, will resonate with them, I'm sure. But yeah, Leicester are back in form at a bad time. And the two teams, Leicester and Bournemouth, they've had kind of neck and neck seasons, haven't they? Sometimes, you know, Leicester just ahead of Bournemouth, Bournemouth just ahead of Leicester. So it promises to be quite a tight game. Yeah, and you think, you know, and let's not forget, it's worth a mention, what a difficult season Leicester have had off the pitch as well with, uh, you know, the, the tragic news from a few months back. So and I th their um, memorial service, I think, took place in Thailand this week. So a few of their um, sort of club staff and, and people have been out to that as well. So, yeah, it's been a difficult season for Leicester in a number of ways um, but yeah on the pitch I mean Claude Puel he, he was seventh in the table and, and still getting pelters from people so um, it's I sort of think back to Sean O'Driscoll here and I hope Sean's not watching this because um, it, people talk about your sort of your public PR persona and um, the one thing that Sean O'Driscoll I don't think ever managed to quite get across was um, sort of that PR public side to, to sort of get fans on side if you like so I think Claude Puel had the same sort of problems really um, in terms of you know he, he never his sort of public the side of him was was never it never sounded that excited about much and um, the football sometimes was a bit bland I'm not saying Sean's football here was bland at all he played good football um, but yeah I think that I think that came to came back to haunt Claude Puel so in Brenda Rogers they've got a guy who's probably quite relieved to come away from the Goldfish Bowl of Celtic had some success there great for him now another chance in the Premier League hopefully building back towards maybe getting another big job in the future and you mentioned earlier Harry Maguire's obviously going to be out of the game missed got sent off against Burnley just a couple of weeks ago how much of a, a boost for the, the Cherries can that be you know they've already scored four against Leicester this season so let alone when they're without one of their top defenders yeah I mean he's been you know credit to him he stayed at Leicester this season I mean he over the summer after the World Cup he had could easily have moved on um, I think but you know Leicester said they wanted to keep him so he stayed and got his head down um, lasted what, four minutes against Burnley I think before getting sent off so you'd imagine that Wes Morgan will probably come in you know captain them to the Premier League title has found his chances restricted um, but yeah so I mean, I guess in terms of losing what your England centre back, that's got to be a blow. Um, but Wes Morgan's proved himself to be a, a very good performer. He's probably coming towards the end of his, uh, you know, being a top level defender. He's probably got a couple of years left. Um, but, you know, he's uh, he's got a new deal, I think, at Leicester. So he's a, a more than able replacement. But yeah, it's, it's not ideal, of course, for Leicester to, to lose an England centre half. And you mentioned the likes of Vardy Madison. They've got some really good young talent in their team, don't they? Yeah, I mean, Demario Gray, I think Cherry's fans would have loved to have seen him here. Um, you know, he was here obviously the other night playing for England under 21s. He's a, he's a frightening player when he gets going, that is for sure. Madison, I think, is, you know, he's made a huge breakthrough this season. Um, it, it, right on the fringe of the England squad at the moment, um, you know, would be, um, I, I think, won't be far away at all from the, the coming months of, of being in that. Vardy, of course, is up and down. Um, I think he's more up at the minute than down. He seems to have been revitalised by... Um, life under Brendan Rodgers um, so yeah attacking wise even you think of people like Mark Albrighton who's been out of the team he's recently but has been a great servant for a long time so yeah they've got a real good English hub of, uh, of, of attacking players and, and quite a few that will give Bournemouth a few problems tomorrow and in terms of our team news positive signs after quite a a tough few weeks with injuries. Dan Gosling's been training and Junior Stanislas has been training too. Adam Smith, let's not forget as well. Yeah, um, everybody from international seems to have come back uh, fit, which is good. Um, and as you say, those guys, Junior Stanislas, I think they, 
he's been treated with a little bit with kid gloves because we've seen what happens before he breaks down if he comes back too early. So I think they, they just don't want to see him going into the summer injured, basically. Um, so, you know, get someone like him absolutely right before he comes back. Um, Adam Smith looked like he was going to be struggling for a while, but I think he is potentially a couple, maybe one or two weeks away, which would be good. Um, Steve Cook, I don't, as I said before, I don't think we're going to see again this season. And Dan Gosling obviously has had one or two little niggles this season as well, which has seen David Brooks playing in central midfield a couple of times, just short of other options. So be interesting to see how Eddie goes tomorrow, whether if Dan Gosling is fit um, and Andrew Sermon is available, whether David Brooks continues in that central role with other wide players available. You know, Jordan and I have obviously played um, last time out. So yeah, a couple of little interesting selection choices for Eddie. Absolutely. Well, it's going to be a very exciting game indeed. If you are going up to Leicester, then we hope you have a safe journey. But if not, make sure you listen to Chris on live commentary on AFCB TV. Thanks for joining us.